In today's lecture, we will discuss the decolonization of Africa between 1945 and 1980. Many peoples around the world gained their independence, mostly peacefully. Shocking, I know. Over 100 nations joined the United Nations, meaning they were recognized as sovereign nations by the rest of the world. Decolonization and the Cold War were the two most important developments in world history following World War II. In Africa, it takes center stage. We will discuss reasons for the decolonization, look at some examples of non-peaceful decolonization, and as a case study, look at the unique situation of South Africa. This map is a nice comprehensive view that gives us the date of independence. There are patterns north to south. For example, the dates get later as you go further south. Likewise, this map shows us that certainly not all independence happened peacefully, as indicated by the guerrilla warfare symbol, and unfortunately, just because people became self-governing, not all of their problems were solved, as indicated by the border wars, civil wars, and severe cases of drought and famine. There are a few general statements we can make about decolonization of Africa. To answer one of our overview questions, what are the reasons Africa is decolonized after World War II? Several factors influenced decolonization. One, the indigenous peoples demanded it. What started in the early 20th century would be interrupted by both world wars. Now independence movements were in full force, and if the Europeans chose to try to stop them, then two, it would be extremely costly, both economically and politically, and Europe couldn't afford either. Three, furthermore, the Cold War ideology of the Western democracies would also contribute. If what separated the United States and Europe from the Soviets was freedom, then how could we continue to be hypocritical when it came to the colonies? Also, if independence is granted peacefully, the US and Europeans are much more likely to retain economic ties and possibly keep them as allies. Another general statement we can make is that mostly the colonial borders became the newly independent nation's borders. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the high age of European imperialism next to the borders of the independent nations. The names change from German East Africa or British East Africa to Tanzania and Kenya, but the borders remain the same. The major exception to that is French West Africa, which is broken into multiple nations. Another generalization we can make relates back to when we first discussed European imperialism in Africa. We talked about the French view of imperialism, often meaning attempted assimilation of indigenous peoples and French settlers called colons moving to their African colonies and making lives for themselves there. We compared this to the British view, which had few settlers and indirect rule. Thus, when it came to decolonize, Britain was more likely to allow independence peacefully than France but France was better than Belgium, who had so few colonies to begin with. Needless to say, Africa's ethnic boundaries were quite different from the country's boundaries. These illogical boundaries drawn after the Berlin Conference in 1884 would lead to problems with civil wars and border disputes during and following decolonization. Now let's look at some examples in each region of Africa. First, Algeria and Northern Africa is a good example of how where France tried to hold on to its colony because of the colons not wanting to give up their comfortable lifestyles and land in Algeria. France winds up in fighting guerrilla forces, similar to and at the same time, they are fighting the Vietnamese. And it is the French people who convince the president, Charles de Gaulle, to grant independence in 1962. The Algerian economy remains tied to the French to this day. In West Africa, in Nigeria, a civil war erupts after Great Britain grants independence in 1962. The Ibu tribe, uh, which is a Christian minority, did not wish to be governed by the Muslim majority and attempted to secede and create its own country, Biafra. After three years of much death and destruction, a military leader, Colonel Gawan is able to uh, 
reunite the country with a strong authoritarian government. This was often the case in Africa and elsewhere. These so-called strong men united peoples uh, at the price was often lack of freedom. In the case of Zaire in Central Africa, the UN tried to keep peace between tribal factions, but another strong man stepped in. Because of his pledge to keep communism out of Zaire, the US backed his repressive regime. As we have seen in Latin America and other places, the US policy of containment sometimes operated under the old maxim of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. While the British typically did not have a lot of settlers in their African colonies, British East Africa was the exception to this. Initially, they sponsored a policy of gradual independence where they advocated for a power sharing government for all citizens, European and African, would have equal rights. While indigenous peoples were not against Europeans having equal rights, they certainly didn't want to share power or gradually get that power. War erupted in 1952 and guerrilla warriors known as Mau Mau threatened peaceful negotiations between the British and the Kenyan African Union and its leader Jomo Kenyatta. Stop the lecture and go to the PowerPoint to view the video on the Mau Mau, then come back to view the remaining lecture. In Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Angola, it was white European colonists who first declared independence from their European governments who resented calls for independence with equal representation. In those countries and others, indigenous peoples did not have self-determination, even though the country was technically independent. There were several Pan-African movements that also developed in the years after World War II. They hoped that they could solve problems among African countries without interference from outsiders. And as a united front, they could have more clout in determining world affairs. An example was the Bandung Conference in 1955. It accomplished the vote on declaring Africa as a non-allied in the Cold War, but not much else could be agreed on. Another Pan-African group was the Organization of African Unity, which was formed in Ethiopia in 1963. It had similar results. The African Union developed from it. It has been much more successful than its predecessors, particularly since it changes policy of non-interference. Now we will turn to our case study of South Africa. You will remember that when we did European imperialism in Africa, we looked at the Boer Wars and how the Union of South Africa was formed by combining the two British and the two Dutch colonies when Britain defeated the Boers. We said that the Dutch or the Boers reluctantly stayed as subjects of the British crown and enjoyed the same privileges they had under their own government. The British had a small governmental force and police force and imported labor from India. In 1921, an elaborate system of racial discrimination became law. Apartheid, or apartness in Dutch, placed people into racial hierarchy and the African people were sent to reservations that had little to no natural resources, including no farmland, thus making the indigenous people dependent on the Europeans for jobs in the diamond and gold mines or in retail businesses. Over time, laws became strict and enforcement was sharp. All laws limited the amount of contact indigenous Africans had with the European population and limited their abilities to be self-sufficient. Furthermore, many of the apartheid laws took away people's civil and human rights. The chief organization to oppose apartheid was the African National Congress. At first, they were led by Western educated, assimilated black men. Consequently, they did not have a large following until the very charismatic Nelson Mandela started bridging the gap. In 1960, nonviolent protests in which the past laws were being demonstrated against ended in the police firing on the crowd and killing 69, injuring 180. International protests led to the British government firing the police chief, the arrest of Mandela and several others. 
Unhappy that Great Britain didn't support the South African government, they dropped their membership in the Commonwealth. Thus, South Africa became independent in 1960, but freedom for Black South Africans doesn't come until more than 30 years later. Next, you will watch the A Force More Powerful series episode on South Africa that tells the story of the anti-apartheid movement starting in 1985 and the eventual end to this brutal system.